New Orleans was founded in 1718. It was little more than a patch of high ground surrounded by swamps. A tenuous foothold in a vast wilderness. In those early days, New Orleans was nothing like the grand city we know today. It was a raw, untamed outpost where survival itself felt like an act of rebellion. The settlers battled not only the elements, but each other, scraping by in a swampy landscape that seemed determined to reclaim them. The air was thick with humidity, and worse, with disease. Mosquitoes, relentless and ravenous, carried yellow fever, cutting down men as efficiently as an enemy might. The streets, if you could even call them that, were more like rivers of muck, and the stench of rot hung in the air like a grim reminder of the ever-present threat of death. Hurricanes, too, seemed to conspire against them sweeping in from the gulf with a fury that flattened what little they had managed to build. Nature in all her power was an unforgiving opponent. And yet death wasn't just a constant threat, it was a certainty. The mortality rate soared and the fragile population, despite its many losses, continued to grow. With each ship that arrived, settlers clung to the hope of taming this wild land though they must have known that many among them would fall victim to its perils. The inevitability of death loomed large over the colony, and so it was that even as they fought to survive, they also had to plan for what came next. The need to bury the dead quickly became one of the colony's most pressing and solemn duties, a reminder that in this harsh new world, life and death walked hand in hand. In late March or early April of 1718, French explorer Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne de Bienville anchored his small fleet of ships just off what is now the Upper French Quarter, preparing to begin construction on the settlement that would become New Orleans. This moment, though not officially recorded, was remembered vividly by one early colonist who remarked that Bienville cut the very first cane, symbolizing the birth of the new city. Following this initial act, a group of 30 workers, all of them convicts, set about clearing the dense cane break that covered the land. This likely took place around the present day 500 to 600 Decatur Street, when the Mississippi River flowed much closer to what is now downtown New Orleans. Clearing the land was just one of many challenges. From the earliest days of the colony, dealing with the dead proved to be a significant issue. New Orleans, built precariously on swampland, presented an immediate and persistent struggle against the high water table. Early accounts suggest that bodies were often buried along the natural levee system of the Mississippi River, a temporary solution that left much to be desired. The saturated, unstable ground made traditional graves impossible to maintain, and the constant battle with water infiltration complicated burial efforts, setting the stage for what would eventually lead to the city's famous above-ground tombs. As the colony grew, the problems of geography and mortality would continue to define the development of New Orleans. The founding years, fraught with environmental and logistical challenges, were a constant reminder that this new settlement was at the mercy of the elements and the river that both sustained and threatened its existence. The Basilica of St. Louis, King of France, doesn't just stand, it looms as though burdened by the weight of nearly three centuries of history. Its three spires pierce the sky above New Orleans, sharp and unwavering, a testament to both resilience and sorrow. They mirror the city itself, a place that has carried those twin burdens since the first settlers dared to strike their shovels into the swampy ground. The cathedral may be made of brick and post, but that hardly tells the whole story. In New Orleans, nothing is simply built. Structures here are products of the land, shaped by rain, soaked in humidity, raised by hands that understood how quickly fire can undo their work. And yet the people rebuild. They always rebuild. Adrien de Pageur, the Frenchman who dedicated this site in 1721, must have known what New Orleans was destined to be, even in its earliest days, a place where growth is always tempered by loss, where resilience comes at a very high cost. The fire of 1788? Inevitable. In New Orleans, fire is much a part of life as the Mississippi rolling down to the Gulf. Their original church burned, 
Of course it did. But it wasn't long before the people set about rebuilding, as they always do here. By Christmas Eve of 1794, the church was rededicated, a fresh start for a city that understands loss more intimately than most. But anyone who knows New Orleans knows this, the cathedral had never truly been lost, just as the city clings to its ghosts, keeping them alive in the thick air and the stories passed down through generations. The cathedral, too, has always been there. Rebuilt or not, it remains. A constant presence above the quarter, watching over a city that survives by embracing the inevitable and rebuilding time and time again. And so for almost 300 years, people have made their way to this cathedral. They've come to pray, to find comfort, to make their peace with God. But when you step into the cool, dim shadows of St. Louis Cathedral, there's a truth that settles over you, far heavier than silence. Here, you're just as close to death as you are to salvation. Beneath your feet, beneath the worn stones you walk upon, lie the remains of hundreds of souls, some long forgotten, others remembered only in fragments, whispers of lives once lived in the chaos and beauty of this city. There are only two internments clearly marked within the cathedral, a curious fact considering how many lie below. This one belongs to the Marigny de Mandeville family, a name that once held sway across New Orleans. Part of the minor nobility of France, they arrived here with ambition and soon well followed. They became fixtures in the upper echelons of society, as if they were as permanent as the cathedral itself, and perhaps they are, at least in the way New Orleans keeps its dead close, refusing to let them go entirely. The inscription reads, Here lies Francois Philip Marigny de Mandeville, Knight of the Royal and Military Order of St. Louis, and Major of New Orleans, born in Normandy, died in the city in November 4, 1728. Below that is his son, the first of the line of the family to be born in the New World, Antoine Philip Marigny de Mandeville, also Knight of the Royal Military Order of St. Louis and Infantry Captain in the Service of France, born at Moville, February 28, 1722, died in New Orleans on November 6, 1779. And below that, his grandson, Pierre Philip de Marigny de Mandeville, also Knight of the Royal Military Order of St. Louis, infantry captain under the Spanish government. He was born in the city on June 15, 1751, and died on May 14, 1800. The other interment belongs to Don Andre Alamonster, a name that looms large in the history of New Orleans. Alamonster, a nobleman born in Spain in 1724, arrived in the colony in 1769, just as New Orleans was transitioning to Spanish rule. He quickly embedded himself into the fabric of colonial life, becoming the notary public and soon after an alcalde, a role akin to the city councilman. As if that wasn't enough to cement his place in New Orleans society, he later purchased the prestigious title of Royal Standard Bearer. But Alamonster's true legacy lies in his generosity. His name is immortalized through some of the most iconic landmarks in New Orleans. The Cabildo, the St. Louis Cathedral, and the Presbyter, all of which were funded in large part by Alamonster. These structures not only shape the architectural skyline of the French Quarter, but also symbolizes the new Spanish influence on the city, all thanks to his civic-minded vision. Since 1850, the bishops and archbishops of New Orleans have found their final rest beneath the pews of St. Louis Cathedral. Men of power, men of the cloth, who once walked these streets, whispered prayers, and guided the faithful now lie in the earth, just beneath your feet. The most recent to take his place beneath the cathedral was Archbishop Philip Hannon, interred in 2011. His body lowered into a crypt that had been waiting patiently for him. But these crypts, these silent chambers below, hold more than just the clergy. Buried in the very foundation of the cathedral are lay people, their names long since forgotten, their identities erased by time, yet they remain deep in the soil. 
the city disasters, the floods, the fires, the wars, didn't just disrupt the living. Records crumbled, and like the bones beneath the floor, they too turned to dust. Many of the dead have lost their names, their exact resting places now mysteries. In death, they've mingled with one another, blending together in a way the living never could. Today, seven crypts remain, set aside for future archbishops, standing at the western edge of the foundation like unclaimed appointments with destiny. Time seems to hold its breath there, as if death is watching, waiting for the next man to claim his place. The crypts are open rarely, and only when death makes its inevitable call. To reach these crypts, you must open discreet panels in the flooring, revealing narrow, ancient stairs that descend into the cool, damp earth below. The stairs are century old, worn smooth by the weight of time, and the creaking doors beneath them lead to a place few will ever see. Some of the crypts, now submerged by the waterlogged soil that constantly threatens to reclaim the city, are inaccessible, unreachable, except perhaps to the river that flows unseen beneath the streets. These crypts remain closed, hidden away in the darkness, until the day comes when another must be laid to rest in the quiet, eternal company of the cathedral's dead. The St. Peter Street Cemetery, first mapped in 1725, was more than a burial ground. It was a reflection of the brutal realities of life in early New Orleans, taking up an entire city block, nestled within what would later become the bustling French Quarter. It was bordered by Rampart, St. Peter, Burgundy, and Toulouse Street. But long before any official maps recorded its existence, the land had already begun its grim work, absorbing the dead into the humid, waterlogged soil of a city that seemed eager to swallow its own. In those early years, people didn't come here by choice. The ground was claimed not by a ceremony, but by necessity, a place where life and death were locked in an uneasy truce. The earth, always damp, always shifting beneath the weight of the city, provided little peace for the dead. Throughout the 18th century, the St. Peter Street Cemetery became the city's primary resting place. Yet, for those interred, rest was a relative term. Unmarked graves were the norm. Cypress coffins laid into the soft soil, quickly forgotten as the ground closed over them, eager to reclaim what little had been left behind. In 1789, the cemetery was officially replaced by St. Louis Cemetery No. 1. But as is often the case in New Orleans, the past refused to stay buried. The dead continued to find their way back to the old cemetery well into the 1790s, particularly when floods made it impossible to access the new site. Even when the land was sold and subdivided at the turn of the century, the bones beneath it stayed put sharing their quiet domain with the buildings and streets that sprung up around them. As the city grew, it did so on the shoulders of the dead, their presence always there, just beneath the surface, silent but never truly forgotten. And ever so often the dead reminded the living of their presence. In 1984, during routine construction, the earth gave up 29 graves, fragile remains reappearing in the daylight, their story still buried deep within their bones. In 2011, a homeowner digging for a swimming pool unearthed other graves, and once more 15 souls were carefully reburied at St. Louis Cemetery No. 1. It's as if the land, reluctant to let go of its secrets, holds tight to these stories, waiting for the right moment to reveal them. For much of the 18th century, the St. Peter Street Cemetery was the resting place for nearly all of colonial New Orleans a site where social status, race, and origin seemed to matter little so long as one had been baptized a Catholic. French settlers lay beside free people of color, Native Americans, and enslaved Africans. The bones that surface now tell stories that history had long tried to forget. Some show the marks of shackles, others the fractures of arms broken in desperate self-defense. Many show the wear and tear of bodies worn down by a lifetime of labor. These were the people who built the city, its streets, its walls, its foundations, and then were buried without a word, their names swallowed by time. 
and yet the earth remembers them. It holds them close, refusing to let their stories vanish entirely. Even as New Orleans has grown and thrived, building upward, outward, over the bones of the past, the land beneath has not forgotten. It bears the weight of history, written in the bones, a silent witness to the lives and deaths that shaped the city. St. Louis Cemetery No. 1, like so much of New Orleans itself, stands as a monument to both endurance and the relentless passage of time. Its whitewashed tombs and crumbling stones serve as silent witnesses to the countless souls that have passed through its gates, each one leaving their mark on the city, even in death. If you're hoping to uncover the hidden stories of St. Louis Cemetery No. 1, brace yourselves. This isn't a place you can just wander into on a whim. Access is tightly controlled, and if you want to stroll through these ancient grounds, you'll need to join an official guided tour. Why? This isn't just any burial ground. It's one of New Orleans' most iconic resting places, a maze of above-ground crypts that seem to defy the natural laws of decay, suspended in time under the Louisiana sun. What makes St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 so captivating isn't just the cemetery's age, though it has been around since the 18th century. It's the extraordinary people who are buried here and the rich tapestry of local customs that weave through each stone and crypt. The city's unique burial practices reflect the cultural melting pot that is New Orleans, and if you're lucky enough to snag a spot on one of these doors, you'll be in the hands of expert guides who know every inch of the place, sometimes with a wink and a joke to lighten the mood. You'll be walking in the footsteps of history as you pass the tomb of Marie Laveau, the fabled voodoo queen whose reputation continues to send shivers down the spines of visitors even to today. And if that's not enough, you'll also see the final resting places of several city mayors, not to mention Homer Plessy, the man whose name is forever tied to the infamous Supreme Court case, Plessy v. Ferguson, a pivotal moment in the civil rights movement. The official tour guides must be applauded for their blend of humor, enthusiasm, and encyclopedic knowledge. They just don't recite facts, they bring these long lost souls back to life, making the tour both educational and surprisingly entertaining. Whether you're a serious history buff or simply looking for an intriguing slice of New Orleans past, this tour offers a rare glimpse into the heart of the city where the dead have as much to say as the living. Tours depart daily every 15 minutes from 9 a.m. to 3.45 p.m. Advanced reservations are recommended. Groups are limited to 20 guests per tour. I'll leave a link in the descriptions. In a city like New Orleans, where life and death have always waltzed in step, the cemeteries are both monuments and sentinels, guardians of a past that refuses to fade. From the earliest burials in the swampy, shifting soil to the grandeur of marble tombs, the city's dead have never been far away, interwoven with the living, shaping the very foundations on which New Orleans rose. Fires come, floods rage, and epidemics sweep through, leaving their scars, yet the city endured. Through it all, the dead have remained, silent witnesses to the evolution of a place that knows how to survive. Their bones, their tombs, their stories, each one is a thread woven into the intricate tapestry of New Orleans history. The city holds them close, always, because here the past is never truly gone. It lingers in the thick air, echoes through the narrow streets, and most of all, rests in the quiet sanctuary of the cemeteries, where the living and the dead meet in a constant coexistence. In this city that has been battered and rebuilt countless times. The dead are more than memories. They are part of the fabric. A reminder that in New Orleans, resilience is both an art form and an inheritance. I want to personally thank you for watching this episode. And now, this is what I need out of you. I need you to subscribe because nothing happens without you. I need you to smash that like button. I need you to comment because I want to hear what you have to say about this video. 
and I need you to share this video far and wide. And remember, it's not goodbye. It's see you next week on Gulf Coastal Connection.